Good evening, everyone. May I remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live via the internet and the recorded archive for future viewing. Thank you. Moving on to part one, um, agenda item one, any apologies for absent? <coughs> Councillor Burnett. Councillor Anmore. Leader. Uh, Councillor Janice Charles. Okay. Agenda item number two A, to hear the roll call of members. Councillor Julie Aviat. Councillor Vincent Bailey. <coughs> Councillor Rhiannon Birch. Councillor Jonathan Bird. Councillor Bronwyn Brooks. Councillor Liz Burnett. Councillor George Carroll. Councillor Christine Cave. Councillor Millie Collins. Councillor Jeff Cox. Councillor Robert Crowley. Councillor Pamela Drake. Councillor Vince Driscoll. Councillor Stuart Edwards. Councillor Ben Gray. Councillor Owen Griffiths. Councillor Stephen Griffiths. Councillor Tony Hampton. Councillor Sally Hanks. Councillor Nick Hodges. Councillor Hunter Jarvey. Councillor Gwyn John. Councillor Ian Johnson. Councillor Gordon Kemp. Councillor Peter King. <coughs> Councillor Matthew Lloyd. Councillor Kevin Marney. Councillor Catherine McCaffer. Councillor Neil Moore. Councillor Michael Morgan. Councillor Jane Norman. Councillor Rachel Nugent Finn. Councillor Andrew Parker. Councillor Bob Penrose. Councillor Sandra Perks. <coughs> Councillor Andrew Robertson. Councillor Leighton Rowlands. Present and evidence clear. Councillor Ruba Sivignanum. Councillor John Thomas. Councillor Neil Thomas. Councillor Stefan William. Councillor Margaret Wilkinson. Councillor Eddie Williams. Councillor Mark Wilson. Councillor Margarita Wright. Okay, moving on to agenda item four, which is to receive any announcements. Oh, agenda item three is to approve the minutes of the last AGM. Can they be approved? I uh, move the minutes of um, the meeting on the 25th of April first, uh, Mr. Yeah, Mayor. I'll second the 25th of April first. <coughs> and the minutes of the annual meeting on the 9th of May as well. I uh, move those minutes as well, Mr. Mayor. Second May. those as well. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number four is to receive any announcements from the Mayor, the Leaders, Member of the Cabinet or the Head of Paid Services and also to receive any petitions from any members. First of all, I would like to uh, hand over to Rob um, on uh, the Management Director. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just wanted to say a few words and I'll keep it brief. Um, I think it's common knowledge that Reuben Bergman is uh, leaving the council and this will be his last council meeting. Um, Reuben has worked with us here at the Vale for uh, approaching 10 years and in that time he has been a very important and much valued member of the corporate management team. 
Uh, over the last three years in particular, and in my role as managing director, I've worked very closely with Ruben, and, and I can say without fear of contradiction that his input has been enormously significant, not only to corporate management team, but to the council as a whole organization. Um, he's provided very sound advice. He's been at the forefront of many initiatives moving in moving the organization forward and in moving it forward in a really positive way. Uh, his values as an individual have always been very closely aligned with the values of this council. Um, his input, drive and commitment in engaging with the workforce across the council and in developing new ideas and promoting an innovative approach have been vital to the success of this organization. Uh, his input will be greatly missed by me personally um, and also by colleagues from across the council, from all departments. And I'm sure um, members will join me in wishing Ruben a happy and above all healthy retirement and all the very best for the future. Leader of the Opposition, Neil Moore. Um, thank, thank you. And can I echo the, the sentiments that Rob has just said in terms of Ruben? Um, during my term as leader of the council, um, Ruben was an inspiration. We we had so many changes. We had different management structures. We had to rely on HR for everything. And apart from that, what we did later and what Ruben did really as the spear in uh, spear, the spearhead of, of, the, of the service ensured that the, st the staff went with us at the difficult times that we've had we've had things like the 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 the, ca the cafe presentations come in every every week and every month some people coming there the staff have been on board they understand where we're coming from and really to be honest i have to say this down this down to reuben i know the staff under him will miss him i know that i'll miss him I know the rest of the council will miss him. So can I, I don't know if you're going to retire or move to Pastures Green, whichever it is, I wish you all the very best in the world. Thank you for your time here. I know it's been difficult. You've been living here and I know um, your home is elsewhere in your head anyway. Um, from the Labour Group, we'd like to, we've given you, a, got a card and a small, a small gift for you to thank you for the work that you've done for us, all members of this council, but particularly the people of the Vale of Morgan. Uh, Councillor Gwyn John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would just like to uh, echo everything that's been said. Uh, I found uh, Ruben has done an excellent uh, job for this council, and uh, all the times we've worked together. As when I was a cabinet member, I was so impressed with the information and the support he gave us. So, Ruben, very best for the future. Absolutely wish you and your family every good wish. Thank you. Leader. Oh. Councillor Johnson, sorry. Thank you. Um, of course, I'd like to echo uh, the comments that have been made by, uh, by other leaders within the, uh, the Council Group. It's been a great pleasure working with you, being a member of the, uh, of the Corporate Resources Committee and seeing the impact that you've had over, over many years on this Council. And wish you all the best for the future. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Good to be working. Is it? Yeah? Oh, good. The light's gone out. Um, I'd like to concur with everything that's been said by Rob. Neil and the other leaders. I was going to mention something when I introduced the next report, but uh, I'd probably be remiss not to actually do it now. I'd like to thank Ruben uh, personally for all the help he's given me over the last 12 months and uh, the uh, new administration. It uh, must have been a bit uh, trying for you sometimes, trying to uh, keep us all in line and um, give us all the right advice, but uh, <coughs> it's certainly been a lot easier with uh, you to help us and I'd certainly like to <coughs> wish you all the very best for, uh, for the future, whatever it may bring. Uh, hopefully. Uh, I don't know whether, I'd say whether you're going to retire or whether you'll be doing something else, but uh, it obviously won't be in the veil, and that will be uh, our loss. But um, thank you very much for everything you have done.
Does any member have any petitions to hand in? Councillor Morgan. Yes, I, I have a petition to present on behalf of the Vale communities for future generations. The petition is in respect of the consultation process for the proposed link road between the M4 and the A48. The petition seeks that the Welltech consultation process is returned to the beginning on the basis that notice given to local people was inadequate for them to fully engage in the process. That is the petition. I have received a petition through the Mayor's Office uh, from 20 mile per hour plenty for Sully. It's a petition to introduce a default 20 mile speed limit on all roads in Sully and Swanbridge and I will present that to the Council. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number five, which is the report of the Managing Director. Leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you weren't aware before, I'm sure you're all aware now that uh, the <laughs> current Head of Human Resources and Organisational Development will be leaving the Council at the end of August 2018 after nearly 10 years' service with the Council. During this time, significant strides have been made in relation to the modernisation of the Human Resources Service, the development of the organisational agenda, and latterly in his <coughs> role as Senior Head of Service, bringing together the People and Performance Agenda. The challenges and demands on the Council services will require continued momentum in relation to these issues, as well as a response to the specific reshaping targets of the Resources Directorate. This report sets out a proposal for the restructuring of the Council's HR and performance structure based on the establishment of a new post of Head of People and Performance. The flattening and reshaping of the structure below that new post and the joining up of like services. This proposal is set out in paragraphs 18 to 30 and in Appendix C. The proposal has been framed alongside the consideration of a number of alternative options which are set out in paragraphs 11 to 17 and for the basis of consultation during August as part of the Council's managing change and avoiding redundancy procedures. The specific recommendations are set out at uh, paragraphs 1 to 7 of the report. They seek approval for the establishment and grading of the new post of Head of People and Performance subject to the consultation, and then the provision of delegated authority to the Managing Director in consultation with myself in order to refine and progress the wider proposals. Any substantive change to the proposal to create the new post will, if necessary, be referred back to Council, and any substantive changes to the wider proposals will be referred to Cabinet. So I move the reports. Second. Okay, all those in favour of the recommendations 1 to 7, raise your hands. Okay, that's passed. Okay, moving on to agenda item number 6, which is a report from the Monitoring of Officer and Head of Legal Services, Democratic Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a, basically a very simple housekeeping exercise. It simply advises Council of the recent redesignation of the Head of Legal Services to be the Monitoring Officer stroke Head of Legal and Democratic Services, which necessitates amendments to the Constitution where we redesignate uh, a person's description. So I recommend that the Council's Constitution and Officer Delegations be amended to reflect the redesignation of the Head of Legal Services to the Monitoring Officer stroke Head of Legal and Democratic Services. I so move. Second. Seconder. Okay. Second. All those in favour? All right. Moving on to agenda item number seven, which is a reference on the Cardiff Capital Region City Deal. Um, leader. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The report in front of you sets out the case for establishing a joint overview and scrutiny committee for the Cardiff Capital Region City Deal and the Council's membership of that joint overview and scrutiny committee. The report was, re was reported to the Environment and Regeneration Scrutiny Committee on the 12th of July 
and the recommendations of that scrutiny committee are set out. And in summary, they are that the committee supports the establishment of a joint overview and scrutiny committee and nominated and recommends to Council the Chairman of the ENR Scrutiny Committee and Council Mora's Deputy to represent this authority on the CCRCD JOSC. The report provides all the relevant background information into the City Deal with which members should be well versed from previous reports. The report clarifies that it was initially proposed that scrutiny would be undertaken by Council's existing scrutiny committees but it has subsequently been agreed that the councils would work together to create a new city deal joint overview and scrutiny committee to monitor the performance and governance of the city deal on an ongoing basis. At paragraph 13, it makes it clear that the Cardiff Capital Region City Deal Joint Cabinet received a report detailing proposals for the establishment of a joint overview and scrutiny committee, and this report also sets out the terms of <coughs> reference for the joint committee. The Regional Joint Cabinet report and the draft terms of reference are attached to appendixes A and A1 for information. Bridgend County Borough Council has agreed to be the host authority for scrutiny support for the JOSC. It is important to note that all ten participating councils are now in a position to consider matters relating to the governance of the Cardiff Capital Region City Deal in relation to the establishment of the Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And Appendix B is a brief paper that provides background and information on the origins of the proposal for the Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee and how it would be established over the first year. Details of the proposals are to be considered by each of the participating authorities, appropriate scrutiny committees or subcommittees before being fully endorsed by full council. The report also makes it clear that training will be delivered by Bridgen Council and following training and briefing sessions, it is proposed <coughs> that two meetings be held within the first year to develop a work program I monitor year one of the business plan, and I so move. Well, I second this now. <coughs> Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Leader, for, for that report. Um, I support the, the concept of a, a joint um, scrutiny committee that will uh, will look into the uh, what the work of the, uh, the city deal regional cabinet is doing. However, there are a couple of issues that I, I would like to raise at this point. Um, firstly. Uh, inside this council, the lead committee for issues regarding the city deal has been the corporate resources um, committee rather than the environment and regeneration committee. So um, that's on our on the forward work plan for the corporate resources committee and not the ENR. So I'm surprised that this report was um, passed to uh, environment and regeneration and that the uh, the nom our, our nominated candidate uh, is the. Uh, is the uh, scrutiny chair for that committee rather than going to the corporate resources committee. Um, my second point is with regards to um, how we've allocated the, um, the nature of um, the, that first role and also a second role because we have here a situation where the, our, our nominated candidate is there because of their post, because they are the, um, the chair of the scrutiny committee that's been um, been allocated, although I, I wait to hear your explanation for that, whilst the deputy, which is nominated as Councillor Moore, with no disrespect to Councillor Moore, is being uh, represented as, as himself, not through a post. And I feel there should be a consistency between um, why somebody is being nominated for representation upon this joint um, scrutiny committee. Uh, my final point then is regards the report back mechanism that we have from this um, joint uh, scrutiny committee, because uh, whoever we send, I'm sure, will do an excellent job in scrutinising and also uh, representing the Vale's interests uh, in that uh, role. Um, but I want to be entirely sure as to how this is going to operate in terms of uh, issues being reported back to us. Can we anticipate that if the nominated candidate um, in that post as uh, chair of the Scrutiny Committee of Regeneration is agreed tonight, um, that that person will be attending meetings of the Corporate Resources Committee on a regular basis in order to properly brief members of that committee as to what is going on at the um, city region level. Thank you. Leader. It's still on. Thank you, uh, Councillor Johnson. The the decision that, that it's the, the um, chairman of ENR scrutiny committee that represents us on the thing and the reason it went to the ENR scrutiny committee is because most of the work of the city deal 
is to do with uh, regeneration, and it seems the most appropriate committee that uh, to select the representative from, yeah. and that is why, uh, well, as Councillor Bailey, but not as as Councillor Bailey, but uh, as the chairman of the committee has been appointed, and. I presume, I wasn't at the meeting, I presume that Councillor Moore's name was put forward as a deputy because he has a lot of experience with City Deal through his uh, role as uh, leader previous to uh, last May. And I must say that my group is more than happy to support Councillor Moore um, to carry out that, that role as deputy. Um, as far as reporting back is concerned, uh, reports I'm sure will come back to the relevant scrutiny committee that it needs to come back to. Uh, it is not really relevant which which committee um, Councillor Bailey's on, whatever committee needs to, uh, to actually look at the um, reports coming back from the Joint Scrutiny Committee, we'll look at it. It may well be reported back to Cabinet as well. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my only concern about this is to make sure that members are fully aware when these meetings take place, that there are agendas published, um, because clearly I've read the report, it does say that members can attend, cannot speak at these meetings, but can attend. And clearly, you know, I think it's incumbent for, for upon all of us, because a lot of issues will arise in the period of City Deal, that we are fully aware of what's going on. And I think sometimes we're not always aware of these joint committees and how they work. And I think it's very important that we do publicise as much as we do on our website and that members are notified. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Wilson. I will ensure that the dates of these meetings, when they are arranged, are um, distributed to all members, so if anyone does wish to attend, they are able to do so. Okay. All those in favour of recommendations uh, one to four, uh, please raise your hands. Okay, that's passed. <coughs> Moving on to agenda item eight is to inform the council of any use of urgency decision procedures under article 14.14 of the constitution. Mr. Councillor Marnie. Yeah, sorry to butt in, uh, it's not a criticism, but um, before I joined this council, there was never any opportunity on mass votes to vote against or to abstain if there was um, immediately a large number of favour. I wasn't going to vote against there, but fortunately we changed that to vote in favour, vote against, abstention. I appreciate it was, there's been nothing controversial here and, I, and there was just a swathe of hands, but um, in the future will we be having the three options as, we, as really we should be? I believe there was a clear majority here, Councillor Barney. I appreciate that. Um, but I Noted for yeah, for it's not one of criticism of you. The reason that I objected five years ago was quite often it was reported in the press and elsewhere and miniature of stuff being unanimous. And it didn't reflect when any of us absolutely objected to it. So that was the reason, and that was the reason for it. Okay, well... It I, I, I've noted I've noted that councillor and thank you very much. Thank you. So Mayor, the agenda item eight is um, for noting or it's just to inform council, so I just move the agenda up. Okay. Note is everyone noted oh. Sorry, sorry, uh, Leader. Could you possibly just update us with regards to item 8D, the draft parking strategy report? I, I, I believe it's just for noting, Councillor Johnson. But the, this is something that's I, I believe it's, system. Yeah, I believe it's for noting. Okay. Okay, moving on to agenda item 9 is to receive questions and answers from, from members. Question one is from Councillor Marley to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Marley, for your question. Support is provided to the small number of pupils who transfer from Welsh to English medium schools 
directly by the receiving school and is managed on a case-by-case -case basis. In most cases, certainly up to years 7 and 8, the level of support is required is minimal as the children already speak English fluently. Any subject-specific language development can in most cases be managed by the individual <coughs> subject teachers. With a very small number of older children transferring from Welsh to English medium after year 8, additional support is provided on a case-by-case -case basis, particularly with the more technical language used in some of the GCSE subjects. Councillor Marley, do you have a supplementary? Very quickly. Um, thank you. So in, in essence, that's a yes then, I would guess. That's your supplementary yes. <laughs> okay, question two is from Councillor Marley uh, to the Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Regulatory Services. Deputy Leader. Thank you, Kevin, for your question. Um, there have been 799 fixed penalty notices issued for littering offences and six fixed penalty notices issued for dog fouling. The number of cases progressed to court was 10. 37.4% of litter fixed penalty notices have been paid to date and 62.5% of the dog fouling fixed penalty notices have been paid to date. Um, the, the notices were issued by 3GS, the Environmental Enforcement Officers, working on behalf of the Council. Councillor Marnie, supplementary. Thank you very much. So, so yet again, we're collecting uh, very few of these. Um, is there any chance of my constant suggestions that we take just about everybody to court um, and uh, expose them in the media for want of a better expression and uh, meet with magistrates to see if we can start charging these people a thousand pounds and actually start collecting these fines. Deputy Leader. I'm not quite sure what um, my, my meeting with the magistrates would do to assist. It's the question of whether people can be traced found and brought to court but um, if you're concerned about the percentage of successful prosecutions and, pe and penalties paid that that's a matter for that I would have to take up with our own uh, legal department and if you want more information let me know and I'll see what I can find out for you yeah I'll, I'll be happy to do that thank you thank you Question number three is from Councillor Marnie to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Contact One Vale received a total of 240,021 calls on all lines between July 2017 and June 2018. Of these calls, 1,956 came through on the Welsh language line so this means that the percentage of calls received that were Welsh language calls is 0.81%. Supplementary, Councillor Marnie. Thank you. Uh, very disappointed that this is even less than uh, when I asked this question five years ago. Um, and as I say, it's supposedly with this 11.5% of people in the Vale speak in Wales that were uh, in the Vale, I should say, um, that doesn't seem to ring true, does it? But uh, my question, very quickly, is would that include calls that have mistakenly rung the Welsh line and those seeking to avoid an advantage over the queues, possibly? Cabinet member. Thank you. We, we are aware that on the Welsh language sign that some shrewd residents have found that the calls get answered quicker on the Welsh line, even though they uh, want to ask the questions in English. I don't think we've got any way of quantifying it as far as I'm concerned, but I can certainly inquire into it and then come back to you directly if you like. Thank you. Question number four is for Councillor Marnie uh, to the Member of Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Marnie, for your question. The Council is required by law to treat Welsh and English on the safe, same basis of equality when dealing with the public and in compliance with the Welsh language standard. The literature and forms generated by all council services, whether in hard copy or online, are required to be bilingual. Each service is expected to comply with this requirement. 
Information may or may not be held by individual services about the number of homes or returns received in Welsh. This information is not, however, at present held centrally, and so it's not possible to provide an answer to the question asked. Councillor Marley, supplementary. Thank you. Um, well, it was the last time I asked. Um, my question would be, as I ask every couple of years, wouldn't it be better if the Vale contacted every household to ask them if they want their stuff in only English, in only Welsh, or in fact both, rather than pander to the language fanatics who would see all that stuff dumped in the bin, when I would like to see it spent perhaps on subsidising Welsh language lessons that currently cost £149 for a 10-week course. Wouldn't that be a better use of any money that's spent in this way, other than just seeing it dumped in the bin for political correctness? Cabinet member. Thank you, Councillor Marley. I think you've made it quite difficult me because you've expressed an opinion more than a second question. I take aboard your comments, but I think I'll... Uh, not answer on the actual comments. Okay. Question five is from Councillor Mrs. Margaret Wilkinson uh, to the leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. The Shared Regulatory Service does not have any legal competence to investigate any offences under the Modern Slavery Act 2015. However, the service does visit a large number of businesses that are allegedly likely to use slave labour. <coughs> I can confirm that SRS officers have been advised tra and trained to look out for certain signs and report those to the police and the human trafficking coordinator. <coughs> the service does therefore act as the eyes and ears facility for the appropriate enforcement agencies. I'm not aware of any investigations currently ongoing in the Vale of Glamorgan or any part of the region. Councillor Wilkinson, supplementary. I don't know why you couldn't have sent that question. Why has it taken so long to answer it for me? Because you promised to answer. Leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I, I, can, uh, can I apologize to you for the fact that you didn't have an answer? Um, and uh, can I also point out the fact that uh, uh, this week the Council Cabinet adopted a code of practice for um, ethical employment in supply chains? So we are doing what we can to uh, support this, uh, this move. Uh, I do apologize for you not having an answer before. Question number six is from Councillor Johnson to the leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I can confirm that in the period 2013-14 to 2017-18, 19,839 court summonses were issued. Only 16 council taxpayers were imprisoned for non-payment of council tax, and with no one having been imprisoned since January 2017. Councillor Johnson, supplementary. Thank you very much um, for that answer. Um, imprisoning people for non-payment of council taxes is frankly Victorian, and I'm sure you'd agree with that. Uh, the uh, consultation with the Welsh Government is currently out. Can you tell me what the Council will be responding and what actions the Council will or will not be taking to ensure that nobody is imprisoned between now and any new regulations coming in? Uh, thank you, Councillor Johnson. I wouldn't agree with you that it's Victorian. And I have no problem with this council taking action against people who will not, who refuse to pay their council tax. I'm quite happy for those people to uh, face the consequences of their actions. We do, however, make every effort to help people who are in a position where they can't pay their council tax. And I will ensure that we always carry on doing that. As far as the council's response to the, um, the consultation um, is concerned, I would say if it were asking for my personal uh, answer to that would be that I wouldn't I would be in favor of keeping the status quo as it is and us having the stick that we need to wave when we need it as far as the council's response is concerned obviously that would have to be consulted on with council and we will uh, come to a conclusion on that question number seven is from councillor Johnson to the cabinet member for neighborhood services and transport mr. mayor councillor Johnson thank you for your question no economic impact assessments have been undertaken for Barry or any other town centre for Capita's draft parking strategy. It should be noted that the proposals outlined in the Capita report for car parks and town centres 
suggests that the first two hours parking is free. Therefore, res for residents and visitors who visit the town centres, they will not have to pay for the first two hours parking. Other Welsh towns, such as Llandidno, Aberystwyth, Bargoed, Carnarvon, have parking charges from the moment you park in their car parks and do not have a free parking period. I am not aware that even these charges have had a detrimental effect on these towns, but obviously if you feel differently you can put forward your own proposals on evidence for consideration as part of our upcoming consultation. Councillor Johnson, supplementary. Thank you for that, that response. I believe you're making the same mistake as the uh, Labour Llantwick Coalition did in putting the Council's bank balance before the well-being of Barry Town Centre. And I would like to ask that in the, uh, as a result of the consultation, um, you will make sure that, ensure that traders are adequately consulted and their, uh, their responses are uh, reported separately so that we can take their expert opinion on whether this will have a negative effect on Barry Town Centre, which is currently losing one shop a month. It's in a bad state of affairs and you're going to make it worse. Sorry, Councillor Johnson, I didn't quite understand what your question was. My question was uh, whether the Cabinet member could confirm that they would be consulting separately and reporting separately with the traders so that we can see their responses. I asked whether the Cabinet would uh, consult separately with traders and report their comments separately so that we can understand their expert opinion on how this will affect their business. I just say we will consult with everyone and we will record their comments and in fact you may well be aware that we made the traders and also the town and community councils aware immediately that this for, uh, report was put in forward so we gave them the maximum notice as well as we could which shows in effect how we have been trying to consult with both traders and councils. Question 8 is from Councillor Johnson to the Cabinet Member for Housing and Building Services. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, your question relates to uh, the under-occupancy penalty, which has now become known as the bedroom tax. The changes to benefit arrangements since April 2013 has meant that if a tenant has one spare bedroom, they lose 14% of their entitled housing benefit. If they have two or more spare bedrooms, they lose 25% of their entitlement. In the Vale of Glamorgan, there were 511 council tenants who have one spare room and 93 who have two or more spare rooms. In April 2018, there were 300, 336 council tenants who had one spare room and 104 who had two or more spare bedrooms. Supplementary, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you much for that answer. It's always good to hear the details. So that's around 600 in 2013 and nearly 450 in 2018. Uh, your party introduced this unfair tax on social housing. Do you think this has worked as a policy? Cabinet member. We have a responsibility uh, with only 3,000 council houses and 3,000 on the waiting list to ensure that all prop properties are used beneficially and wisely. We take great care to ensure that should there prove to be uh, properties that are not fully utilised, then we go out of our way to assist the people to move to another thing. And as far as I'm concerned, it is the right policy because we just haven't got enough accommodation that we can provide for particularly larger families. Thank you. Question 9 is from Councillor Johnson to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services and Transport. Mr Mayor, Councillor Johnson, um, 499 fixed penalty notices were issued between the 1st of April 2017 and the 31st of March 2018. Three were for dogs on leads, two were no fishing, three were dog fouling, 44 were under duty of care, and, that, and that, those were for commercial premises. One was for fly posting stroke graffiti. 35 for commercial waste receptacle offences. 400 and, 
11 uh, littering, of which 93 was issued for cigarettes, 2 for spitting, 193 for general waste, 122 for, for accumulations of litter, that's small-scale fly tipping, and one for public urination. The fixed penalty notices were issued by 3GS, the Environmental Enforcement Officers, working on behalf of the Council. Councillor Johnson, supplementary. Uh, thank you for the update on that. Uh, that's fewer than 1.5 fixed penalty notices issued per day in that time. <laughs> Uh, do you feel that, uh, wh what do you feel is having most impact upon the cleanliness of our streets? Do you feel it's having environmental enforcement officers or the cuts that your, uh, your administration is implementing to our visible services? Cabinet member. We will continue to do an enforcement work and in fact uh, 3GS, I believe their contract finishes at the uh, end of November this year. And we will obviously be reviewing our enforcement uh, procedures at that time, or before, just before that time. Question 10 is from Councillor Perks to the Cabinet Member for Regeneration and Planning. ...fully operational. Planning application 2017-0 one zero eight zero full which seeks a comprehensive permission for the site is still under consideration by the council and welsh government uh, sorry and welsh government is now separately considering whether the development proposal by that application should require an eia an environmental impact assessment but the council has not yet received a formal decision on this matter for information welsh government advised that the applicant advised the applicant in february that it was minded to require an EIA, but invited comment from the applicant. The Council was further advised on the 22nd of May, following a re request from the Leader of the Council, that Welsh Government continue to consider the legal position, and Council has received no further information <coughs> in this regard. Councillor Perks, do you have a supplementary? Hi. Um, my supplementary is, um, what levels of pollution have been measured by the two air monitors to date and how does this compare with the legal or advisory limits? Uh, the plant is not operational, so it's not, not producing anything, it's not burning any wood, uh, so, and I couldn't tell you what is coming out of there at the moment because I, I can come back to you on that, I can give you an answer. I don't have those figures at the top of my head, but it is not operational. You, you've, you, unfortunately, you've already had your question. Maybe you should write to the Cabinet member. Question 11 is from Councillor Perks to the Cabinet member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Perks, for your question. It is intended to keep as much provision for young people at Barry YMCA as possible. Currently, the youth area at the YMCA is used every day in term time between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. This is for small groups and one-to-one -one mentoring of young people who are educated other than at school. The centre also supports a young carers group in the evening and the youth service provided open access provision two evenings a week. We have conducted a youth offer consultation 2015-2016 and a youth satisfaction survey during 2016-2017 across the Vale, but not specifically with Barry YMCA members independently. Our intention post structure is for the youth team to engage young people in the design of the curriculum for the evening provision. We will also include the young carers and any other groups using YMCA Barry. The youth service managers have also discussed co-production with YMCA's chief executive, particularly on mu media and music. In addition, Barry Youth Action were consulted on the following dates. The topic was raised by Councillor Payne as part of her Town Council update, link Councillor for Barry Town Council at the meeting on the 26th of February 2018. It was put as an agenda item on the 28th of March 2018 and it was also discussed at a meeting on the 2nd of May 2018 when members read through the minutes of the previous meeting. Councillor Perks, you have a supplementary? 
Thank you for your answer. Um, my sort of question um, is, can a copy of this survey and the directorate outline plans for the service be disseminated, distributed to members and the youth service staff immediately for us all to be assured that a youth service provision will be active in September 2018? Thank you, Councillor Pearl. I don't see any problem with that. I will ask the officers to retrieve this information, to circulate with everyone. And I share, as a, a, a trustee of Barry YMCA myself, the concern that we are using it to its full potential. Okay. Question number 12 is from Councillor Mark Wilson to the Cabinet Member for Social Care, and Healthy, uh, Social Care Health and Leisure. A bit of a mouthful, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Wilson, Mr Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson, for the question on the upgrade to Penarth Leisure Centre. Unfortunately, the original procurement uh, process for this work did not result in an acceptable tender being received. There's been a subsequent retender using the Sell to Wales website. That's now been completed, and it appears that a successful tender has been received, and hopefully um, the, the contract will be let in the very near future. The contractor that is likely to be appointed has proposed alternative working methods for the work which will enable the um, centre to remain open throughout the process and that will result in the work being completed that much more quickly. Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you for your reply, Cabinet Member. Um, the supplementary question is, will you inform members, mostly in, obviously in local members of Sully, Dennis Powers, Landock and of course Penarth about when this work will take place, how long would it take place and give us regular updates so that we can obviously scrutinise what is occurring. Thank you. Thank you for that Councillor Wilson. If you recall the answer I gave uh, I think in February to your um, colleague from Penarth was that the work will be completed by the 25th of January 2019. It's anticipated, with specifically with the new ways of working, um, this will be a far quicker process, and we're looking for it to be completed by the end of March 2019, so a little, uh, perhaps about two months later than before. Can I suggest that if there appears to be any reason for a delay, that members will be notified of that, but if there is no delay, then March, end of March 2019 will be the completion date. Question number 13 is from Councillor Wilson to the Member of, for Neighbourhood Services and Transport. Mr Mayor, Councillor Wilson, uh, I can confirm that there are currently no plans to dispose of the toilets in Penarth Town Centre. The Council has a statutory obligation to prepare a local toilet strategy by the 31st of May 2019, which will need to be con which will need to consider the availability of toilets, both public and private, in the Vale of Glamorgan. That's private youth toilets, obviously, which can be used by the public, just to clarify that matter. All toilet provision will therefore need to be considered as part of this strategy, which you will have the opportunity to comment on in due course. Supplementary, Councillor Wilson. Thank you for your answer. I'm glad you give that reassurance that the public toilet in the centre of Penarth will remain, because you confirmed that for the lifetime of your administration. Councillor Wilson, you know you can't confirm things like that for goodness knows how many years uh, a time, but I've told you that it'll be part of a local toilet strategy, second time I've said that, by the 31st of May 2019, and there'll be plenty of time for consultation by all members. Question 14 is from Councillor Wilson to the leader. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. I would refer Councillor Wilson to the Cabinet report of the 3rd of July, which provides information regarding the categories of assets and services. Paragraph 20 of the report provides information on this and defines services and assets that are strategic to the Vale of Glamorgan. Councillor Wilson, supplementary. Okay, question is, what consultation was made in relation to what was decided as being regarded as strategic asset. Leader. 
the, ref the report defines strategic assets as a location or destination such as Barry Island, Penarth Pier and key parks and gardens, uh, examples of which could be uh, Windsor Gardens, Alexander Park, Penarth and the Knapp Gardens in Barry, mm -hmm. and strategic buildings which would include the Kimmin in Penarth. Um, I don't think there's any consultation being done on that. That is uh, the opinion that we, we have taken on uh, what is strategic and what isn't strategic. Question number 15 is from Councillor Liz Burnett to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services and Transport. Mr Mayor, Councillor Burnett, um, with your concern about this process, you <coughs> could of course, of course uh, call the matter into full scrutiny. Uh, I did not refer the matter to the scrutiny committee myself as authority was sought from Cabinet to progress public consultation. And surely the most, appro appro most appropriate time for the proposal to be scrutinised is when members have the benefit of the public views on the proposal. Once the consultation period is finished on the 22nd of August 2018, the results will be reported and final proposal will be referred to scrutiny for consideration. The formal public consultation started on the 27th of June 2018 and will continue to the 22nd of August 2018. Once all comments from the key stakeholders and the public have been considered and a final proposal has been produced, there will be a final consultation period for four weeks. Dates for the pop-up events have now been released on the Council's website. It is not necessary to extend the consultation period. There has been significant interest in the matter, as members will be aware of, and a large number of responses have been received already, and there is still over a month left in which to provide comments. Councillor Burnett, supplementary. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Um, I think members will be aware that the original cabinet report actually gave details of the failed consultation which was set in the scene. It actually didn't include details of this current consultation, so it'd be worthwhile going back and looking at February's cabinet report and reading it more thoroughly. At every stage, you failed to open this proposal to scrutiny, either by members of this council or, more importantly, by dog owners, the people most affected. If you had most of this miscommunication and upset Councillor could Burnett, have been avoided. Councillor Will Burnett, you, I am Council asking a question now. Question. I am setting a scene because incorrect information was given in the answer. Will you make arrangements for public meetings or even better, workshops with dog owners to come up with reasonable restrictions and work in partnership with them on the implementation? Thank you. Cabinet member. Thank you, Councillor Burnett. We are fully aware of the need to consult with the public, and we believe the best way of doing that, in, addi in addition to the correspondence sent out, is roadshows, where we can get individual responses from the public on the matter. And we welcome all responses that people want to say in, send in, be they in favour or against. Thank you. Question 16 is from Councillor Burnett to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services and Transport. Mr Mayor, Councillor Burnett, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, as you'll be aware, Cabinet has not yet taken any decision on any aspect of the parking strategy except to seek views on its content. Therefore, it's incorrect at this stage to refer it as the Council's parking strategy. The executive summary of the consultant's capital report on page one states that the strategy proposes to introduce measures designed to strengthen economic and regeneration opportunities by introducing improved efficient car park management as well as improving access to facilities and attractions in the Vale and improving the visitor experience. Further, the draft capital report recognises clearly <laughs> that town centres are the hub of local communities and adequate prop properly located safe parking are more important to people parking in town centres than tariffs. 
This is featured on page 5 of the consultant's report. Should the council decide to introduce parking charges, then any income would be used to support existing parking infrastructure and facilities within those areas. I, I'm a bit surprised at your use of the term cash cow, particularly seeing uh, as you yourself considered car charging for car parking during your administration's term. Mm. And you should also be well aware of this council's challenging budget, budget provision. Mm. I do not intend to withdraw this report. Difficult decisions such as whether or not to charge for car parking need to be made. It is important to obtain the actual views of interested people and organisations on the draft strategy and to consider the actual evidence of the impacts of car park charging on town centres and other destinations rather than just acting on unsubstantiated statements such as yours. Supplementary, Councillor Burnett? Yes, please. Um, it is worth rereading cabinet reports before you come up with answers. Um, to clarify, the previous proposals were for four selected car parks where there were issues with turnover and the aim was cost neutrality and getting turnover. When that was felt not to be correct, it was withdrawn. <coughs> it's page 29 before you get off anything other than how much money can be made from these proposals. Councillor Burnett. It doesn't, Count, is it there doesn't a question, discuss please? options available other than punitive ch charging regimes. And the level of cynicism Councillor in it Burnett, is, is there starting a question? car parks at 8 a.m. in the morning and running through to 8 a.m. at night. Yet another attack on dog waters, walkers. What plans do you have to work with local businesses and residents to devise a plan that works for our towns, resorts and destinations and even more importantly for the residents of the Vale. Before the cabinet member um, replies back, can we make sure you get to the question rather than leave it on long statements um, to all members? Thank you. Cabinet member. Councillor Burnett, the report has gone out for consultation. When the consultation results are back in, we will consider what we are going to recommend and therefore it will go through our scrutiny process and be obviously seen by all. But I, I took offence at your reference to a cash cow because perhaps I can quote back to you um, this statement. It is estimated that night income of about 204k will be realised per annum should the above charging structure be approved. And this will be used to offset part of the current 350k budget shortfall and uh, help future budget challenge, uh, challenges which the directors are facing. That's a quotation from the Cabinet meeting of the 27th of July 2015 of a course which you were present. So I don't see why you're talking about us having a cash cow when you, you had the same sort of statement in your purport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well 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 Question number 17 is from Councillor Burnett to the Cabinet Member for Regeneration and Planning. Thank you, Mr Mayor and uh, Councillor Burnett. Um, as um, the previous cabinet member, um, you should know the answer to this, that we did not have proposals to privatise parts of Port Kerry Park. Councillor Barrett, do you have a supplementary? I'm sorry, Councillor Bird, I obviously read the wrong cabinet report. Um, I am interested that you are going forward, however, with the proposals in Cosmeston um, and would be interested to know how you can justify that while cancelling the proposals for Port Kerry or is this Penarth being hit yet again? Councillor Burnett. <laughs> You're getting desperate now. I have always listened to public opinion and I believe we acted on public opinion. Um, we did not propose to uh, privatise Port Kerry Park. We proposed to maybe have a partnership agreement for some glamping pods on a small part of the golf course. But 
we, the reason we withdrew it from Port Kerry Park was public opinion. There was a great deal of public opinion. They didn't want it in Port Kerry Park, fine. That's their view. I, have, I appreciated that and I withdrew it from Port Kerry Park. I have had no such views on Cosmiston or any of the other parks and we will continue to work with partners to look at alternatives. Question number 18 is from Councillor Michael Morgan to the leader. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. I can advise that the well tied guidance does not stipulate the length of consultation required at different stages of the process. However, the well tied guidance does state that collaboration and involvement are important throughout the well tag appraisal. Consultation at the start of the process assists in understanding the current situation, setting objectives, producing a long list of possible solutions and outlining the range of likely impacts from those different solutions. As such, the decision by council officers to undertake a series of stakeholder workshops and to hold a public consultation day in the locality, together with time to respond, was considered proportionate at, for the early stage study. The consultation at this stage allowed for an understanding of issues, setting of objectives and examining a long list of options and their possible impacts. For your information, the workshops and public event were well attended. Following the consultation events, a report for stage one was completed and submitted to Cabinet with a number of options which Cabinet agreed to progress. The stage two process reduced the number of options, as would be expected of a well tagged stage two. These processes are considered holistically and are based on a stage by stage approach. Respondents were able to disagree with the opinions and this will the options, sorry, and this will show they are not in favour of the proposals. They could also add comments and ideas for any different options which would also be considered. The stage two consultation closed yesterday after being open for 12 weeks and has allowed interested parties the chance to submit any comments ide and ideas on the process to date, including stage one. I'm pleased to announce the public response to the current consultation process was extremely high and I'm looking forward to reviewing the consultation report. Councillor Morgan, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Leader, for that uh, considered response. Uh, by way of a brief introduction, Mr Mayor, I would say that the, many people who responded to the consultation uh, felt that their submissions were not being taken into account, and there was a problem in the stage one where half of the submissions question, sent in by, by email weren't received, apparently. So the question is, out, out of respect to everyone who has responded and out of respect to every, the 741 people who signed the petition today, can the Council confirm that they will respond by a full and detailed report which would, will deal with each and every submission made by individuals and groups to the Council so that people in the locality can see that their views have been considered and thought out and can proceed further with this scheme or return to stage one, whatever the Council decides? Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Can I assure you that all the responses will be considered? I can't promise a detailed response to every, um, to every um, consideration, but uh, we will obviously look at every consideration that, that's come forward at every um, consultation, and uh, that will go forward into the uh, next part of the process, and nothing will be ignored. Okay, question number 19 is from Councillor Neil Moore to the Cabinet Member for Social Care, Health and Leisure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for your question, Councillor Moore. Officers have recently been asked to join a working group led by the University Health Board looking at the proposal for Penarth Leisure Centre, in, uh, Centre site in detail. I think everyone would agree that there is support in principle for the development of a primary care facility at, um, or attached to Penarth Leisure Centre, which will obviously provide more services than currently <coughs> offered in GP surgeries. The development has been identified in the Welsh Government Primary Care Projects as a priority scheme which uh, within tranche one of their pipeline projects for completion by the end of 2021 and therefore I would expect uh, to be able to provide updates shortly. I'm sure Councillor Moore will have a supplementary which knowing Councillor Moore I know will be extremely short. Councillor Moore do you have a, do, do you have a supplementary? Possibly. <laughs> Is it short? Um, can I thank the, the Cabinet Member for that response? I'm, I am disappointed that there's only recently work workshops have, have uh, been put into place. 
Um, there are many patients in GP surgeries in Penarth are becoming concerned about the sustainability of their of their own current surgeries, and I know that some GPs are thinking of moving uh, to other premises, which would be a, a little bit of a, a shame. Can can the cabinet member ensure that a press release is issued by this council and or the UHB um, in in order to keep people aware of what's going on? Because I know it is an issue in Penarth. Um, I've raised the question because some of our members are. are uh, of patients there but the point is uh, and th there are many many rumors there are issues about whether surgeries will move and the, the therefore the sustainability and reliability of the current practices needs to be addressed and I wonder if you would ensure a press release goes out uh, with re with updates on an ongoing basis Thank you, Councillor Moore. A short introduction, then a question, and then a conclusion, but we'll accept that. Um, as you will probably appreciate, there will have to be a report to Cabinet when this is going to progress, so there will be publicity. Um, you will also appreciate that primarily this decision on this is going to be made by the UHB, in association with the Council, but primarily by the UHB. We will put as much pressure on them as we can to do that, but unfortunately, things do seem to grind awfully slowly with the UHB. Question number 20 is from Councillor Bailey to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services and Transport. Mr. Bear, Councillor Bailey, thank you for waving. I was trying to find out where you were. <laughs> the public consultation on the possible introduction of a public spaces protection order commenced on the 27th of June 2018 and closes on the 22nd of August 2018. As part of the process, requests for comments were sent to a large number of key stakeholders, include, including Hearing Dogs Wales, RSPCA Wales, the Dogs Trust, and Paws on the Veil. Vale. It's too early to advise of the details of representations, but this information will be made available to elected members on conclusion of the consultation process prior to any decisions being taken on whether or not to introduce a PSPO. Councillor Bailey, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Cabinet Member. I ask the question because there is a great deal of public concern about the consultation, and in particular the impact these proposals could have on dogs owned by people who are disabled, maybe people who struggle with transport issues and their uh, financial challenges. As a dog owner myself, I find it hard to understand any way in which walking my dog off lead could in contribute in any way to whether the mess is picked up or not. The bottom line is you're a responsible dog owner or you're not. Um, we all in this Councillor Bailey, is there a question? This is my question. This one comes to the question. We all want to see the issue of dog fouling tackled um, with stiffer penalties potentially for those worst offenders. But can I ask the Cabinet member to reassure both the public in the gallery and councillors here that this is not official council policy, it is a consultation. And will you join me in encouraging residents from all over the Vale to respond to the consultation, not just with opposition, but also with other ideas on how we can tackle this issue together, hopefully without need to restrict walking off lead. Councillor Bayer, I can reassure you this is not council policy. It's a matter of sending information out for consultation. We will await the response, and the wider response we can get on the consultation, the better. Question number 21 is from Councillor Peter Kane to the Cabinet Member for Social Care, Health and Leisure. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you to Councillor King for the uh, question. It's certainly not the intention to change any of the existing structure um, contained at single-use leisure facilities. Um, some facilities, as you appreciate, such as I think majority of bowling greens are already fenced off, but it certainly doesn't mention the issue of fencing um, facilities or in any way restricting access. It's possible that in future, once clubs respond to what we're looking at, there may be requests for organisations um, to fence in facilities, and obviously those would have to be considered on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, some of the facilities, other than bowling clubs, already have fenced-in facilities. Um, on most days, although they're open to the public um, to access at other times. Um, so there is a possibly reaching a balance between the need for fencing and the need for general public use. But as I say, we will certainly look at things on an on a, on a individual basis once we receive approaches from 
any of the clubs that are interested in this particular issue. Shri? Moving on to uh, agenda item number 10, which is questions from the public. Due to the significant amount of public questions uh, and we, ha we have received and the 30 min minutes available under the Constitution to respond to them, I have agreed that all questions will be taken as read except for two. The two questions are from two pupils of Lancarvin School, listed as questions number 20 and 32 on the agenda. Therefore, the first question on the agenda is from Mr Paul Waite, and I call the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services and Transport to provide a response. Mr Mayor, I don't know whether Mr Waite is here or not. Um, okay. As you are already aware from recent correspondence with the Council, the well tagged process does not specify requirements for consultation or engagement. The guidance, published in December 2017, after the Stage 1 study, states on page 6 that collaboration and involvement are important through a well tag appraisal. At the start of the process, it will assist in understanding the current situation, setting objectives, producing a long list of possible so solutions, and outlining the range of likely impacts from those different solutions. As such, the decision to undertake a series of stakeholder workshops and to hold a public consultation day in the locality, together with time to respond, was considered proportionate for the <coughs> early stage study, as this allowed for an understanding of issues, the setting objectives, and the examination of a long list of options, and together with their possible impacts. The workshops and public events were well attended, the outcomes of a Stage 1 report is to recommend options for further investigation, thus it does not lead to a decision on the project. Moreover, in December 2017, Welsh Government issued a note on how to undertake well tax studies in the light of the Future Generations of Wales Act, published in December 2017. This is available on the Welsh Government website. This advises that engaging and involving stakeholders is important throughout a well tag appraisal, but not, does not specify length or type of engagement. A number of options were considered as part of the Stage 1 process, and these were evaluated with a shortlist compiled for the Stage 2 report. As you're aware, the Stage 2 report was consulted on for 12 weeks, and any comments on the stage one or two reports or any ideas for different solutions could be forwarded as part of this process. The well tag process is iterative and can refine and add options as needed as the process progresses or as situations change. That consultation closed yesterday and I understand that you have made comments on the well tag reports which will be considered by the Council's Cabinet in due course. Question two is from Ms Helen Payne to the Cabinet Member for Learning Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Helen Payne, for your question. The Virgo Morgan Youth Offer will be the focus of our delivery model for the future. It has been devised with young people and will follow the principles and purposes of youth work in Wales and the National Youth Work Strategy for Wales. The key principle of the youth offer is the engagement with young people on the design and delivery of services. During the consultation process, 1,700 young people took part and their feedback was one of the reasons why the need for change to the service was identified. The Youth Offer curriculum is based on the views of young people and comprises the Duke of Edinburgh's award, outdoor activities, accredited learning via wellbeing projects, music media and technology. Duke of Edinburgh awards will be delivered in partnership with the Boys and Girl Clubs of Wales and the Welsh language provision via Irgobaith Cymru. 
for people with additional learning needs. The service is working in partnership with Uskola Derry to establish after-school provision for young people attending the school. The service will also offer a range of targeted and specialised services for young people requiring additional wellbeing support and informal learning opportunities. The service is not going to be delivered by inexperienced volunteers from September 2018. The restructure will provide peripatetic support from qualified staff in all areas of the Vale, at least comparable with the current level. Question number three is from Miss Helen Payne to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. And quality workforce, such as all staff, will be professionally recognised and registered with the Education Workforce Council. All employed staff will have youth support worker level 2 qualifications. There will also be an expectation that staff undertake continuous professional development and progress to youth worker status at level 4 and to degree standards. Staff will also have an ongoing training programme to ensure they are up to date with developments in the youth work field and in education services. There will be annual safeguarding and health and safety coursing as well as specialised training on adverse child experiences and attachment. Any volunteers will have the opportunity to train up to Level 3 Youth Support Worker qualification and have access to all other appropriate continual professional development courses. Question number four is from Ms Helen Payne to the Cabinet Member for, for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Helen Payne. The restructuring of youth services is about creating efficient services to improve outcomes for young people rather than achieving financial savings. There are some small budget savings from a reduction of premises, utilities and rates costs for West House and Lantwick Major Youth Centre, which amounts to approximately £32,000. A further sum of £13,000 will be saved in relation to the mobile provision, which is as a result of income generation and cost reduction. Council number five is, uh, question number five is from Miss Beverly Bailey to the leader. Deputy leader. Deputy leader, thank you. Um, the reply to this question is as follows. There are two principal lawyers, three senior lawyers and one law clerk who provide in part a legal support service to the council and its directorates on matters such as conveyancing, advice on ownership of land and legal enforcement action. Question number six is from Mr Parry to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you Mr Mayor. Thank you Mr Parry for your question. You'll be aware the consultation period has only just closed and that consultation provided all those with an interest to comment on the Council's proposals. At this point of time, a full analysis of the responses has not been possible, and Cabinet will only receive a report on the consultation after the summer recess. Until such time, it would not be appropriate to comment on specific issues relating to the consultation and the way forward. It will only be possible to uh, meaningfully comment once a full analysis has been undertaken, and I and my Cabinet colleagues have an opportunity to reflect on the consultation responses. I would point out as a point of clarification uh, to advise that the funding for this project would come from Welsh Government MAP funding of £2.09 million and £1.63 million of Section 106 funding. The balance of the payment will be made from the Council's capital funding. Question number seven is from Mrs Betley to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mrs. Batley, for your question. You'll be aware that a number of options were considered when developing the current proposal, and these have been outlined in the most recent consultation document. However, as advised previously, the consultation period has only just closed, and at this point of time, a full analysis of, of responses has not been possible. It will only be possible to be meaningfully commented on once a full analysis has been undertaken, and I and my Cabinet colleagues have the opportunity to reflect on the consultation consultation responses. 
question number eight is from Mrs. Uh, Valencia to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mrs. Valencia, for your question. As with all educational <coughs> consultation, the initial information contained in the Community Impact Assessment is sourced from information held within the Council offices and at the school, as well as any other information identified in the initial stages of proposal development. Any information that is received with regard to identified community impact is fed into the final assessment documentation, which is then published alongside the consultation report. The Council doesn't seek to prejudge the impact to the community at the commencement of the consultation, but rather ensures it reflects the evidence received. Engagement with community groups has taken place as part of the consultation process. There is no requirement to meet individual businesses, although the Council has, of course, done so where appropriate or on request. As I have already advised, the consultation <coughs> period has only just closed, and at this point in time, a full analysis of the responses has not been possible. It will only be possible to meaningfully comment once the full analysis has been undertaken. I and my Cabinet colleagues have had the opportunity to reflect on the consultation responses. Question number nine is from Mr Barrett to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Barrett, for your question. The rationale for proposals put forward is included in the consultation document. As the consultation period is only just close, at this point in time, a full analysis of responses has not been possible. It will only be possible to meaningful <coughs> comment once a full analysis has been undertaken. I and my cabinet colleagues have had the opportunity to reflect on the continent consultation responses. I fully appreciate there will be many people who take a different view to that outlined in the consultation document as the council's preferred option. And once I and the officers have analysed the response as a report, will be brought to Cabinet to recommend the way forward. Question number 10 is from Mr Fell to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Cabinet Member. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Fell, for your question. Reference to the Thlancarven as a small rural school was removed as it has added to the confusion expressed by some consultees with regard to the difference between a school closure and school transfer as outlined in the School Organisation Code of 2013. The Council has consulted upon the proposal to transfer Thlancarven Primary School to a new site under Section 42 of the 2013 School Organisation Code, the current code in force. Lists of schools referred to under the new draft proposal code only applies to the purposes of a presumption against closure of rural schools. The Council's proposal to transfer it over a mile has triggered the regulated alteration under Section 42. This is a transfer and not a school closure, and therefore the protection reference in your question does not apply in this case. Question number 11 is from Ms. Hemming to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Call. I'm, I'm sorry, but if you keep if you keep interrupting, I'm trying to get through to the que I'm trying to get through to the question, I, and I'm trying to get through to 33 questions. Please do not interrupt. It, the answer is the answer. Please, we're trying to get through the questions. Question number 11 from Mrs. Hemming to the learning uh, cabinet member for learning and culture, cabinet member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Hemming, for your question. The definition and differences between a transfer and closure of schools is contained within the School Organisation Code of 2013. While I appreciate there may be some confusion over the terminology around closing a school site and closing a school, the consultation makes clear reference to the code to ensure a shared understanding of the relevant statutory guidance. Question number 12 is from Mr. Farkaswan. Right, I have warned you once, if you continue, I will have you removed from the public gallery. Okay, so please let, listen, to the, let's listen to the questions. Right, if, if it continues, then I will ask you to leave. And, and, the, and you, sir, if you continue, I will ask you to leave. 
and I and, and we're trying to give you the answers. It, as per the council's constitution, if there is public disturbance, I have the power to get to remove you from the chamber. I am trying to get the questions to you. If you keep interrupting, your questions will not be answered. Right. The, the, the chap in the blue, can you leave the chamber, please? Leave the, uh, can you leave the chamber? And the gentleman in the pink? Right, I will get security to remove you from the chamber. Please leave quietly. We we have only asked we've we've only asked one person to leave. It is we will get to the children's we, we will get to the children's questions because it comes in as per the, the order of the questions, as they were arrived. I, To, to, to hear the the, uh, the children's questions. Okay. I'm happy to move that as well. So question 20 from Miss Miss Evans. Is Miss Evans in, in the gallery? Yes, she says she Yeah. Why do you want to close... Langhaven Primary School. My grandfather, great aunts and uncles, my aunts, my father, my older sister, my cousins, and now me and my little sister go to the school. I will want my children to go to school one day. We all enjoy school and learn a lot. Everyone who has left has got a job and some went to university. Thank you. Cabinet member. question we all know when we stand on our feet how daunting it can be in the chamber especially after there's been a little bit of a commotion anyway to deal with the reply the proposal doesn't seek to close on carbon primary school it proposes to transfer of the school to a larger site cabinet will only receive a report on the consultation after the summer recess once a full analysis has been undertaken and I and my cabinet members have had opportunity to reflect on the consultation responses if following the further considerations this proposal is taken forward the council would wish to work closely with pupils parents staff and governors to ensure the history of the current building is honored and truly reflected in the new school building okay question number 32 from mr haverfield would you like to read your question out All the politicians in this meeting are grown-ups with children and grandchildren. The trouble that the politicians started with my school has made teachers and colleagues from my school leave. The children need to have clarity when it comes to what happens next in their school, where their school is and, where the, and who their teachers are. 
How do you think your own families would have responded to the kind of change that you propose for the children for Lancarvin School? Cabinet member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Ms. Haberfield. And I apologise, you appear as Mr. Haberfield on the actual question. Um, the Council appreciates that the proposal has caused some anxiety and understands the concerns that have been raised. But I've been assured that no staff have resigned from the school as a result of this consultation. The consultation process allows us to gather views and has provided an opportunity for all parties, including pupils, to make their comments. These comments are very important in helping the Council to reach a decision and all the comments received to be carefully considered <coughs> by Cabinet before they de determine whether to proceed with this proposal. I can give you my assurance that if, after considering the consultation responses, the proposal goes ahead, pupils would be engaged in the development of the project and would, of course, be included in discussions <coughs> relating to the future plans for their school. So, moving, moving on to question 12, which is from Mr. Mr. Borohartson to the Cabinet Member of Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Uh, an affordable housing pre-application advice inquiry was received by the Council recently, but no official planning application has been received to date. In addition, if an application for planning permission is submitted, that application would need to be considered having regard to a number of factors, including the result of consultation and an assessment of all relevant planning considerations. Question 13 is from Mr. Valencia to Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Valencia, for your question. Catchment areas were realigned for the second consultation in response to parental representation received during the first consultation. There is no longer a change proposed to St. Athan catchment area, and therefore this information was correctly omitted from the second consultation document. It was necessary to update all school data for the second consultation in order to ensure the document contained the most up-to-date information. I can confirm the officer concerned has checked the information you have referenced and they have confirmed to me the data contained in the second consultation is accurate. They have also advised me there was an error with regard to this data in the first document which explains the difference between the two figures. I am satisfied therefore this updated information can be considered as reflective of the current position and is an accurate and reliable reflection of the distribution of pupils living across the catchment areas of St. Nicholas and Clanbire. Question number 14 is from Ms. Mrs. Angel uh, to the leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Angel. I'll give Councillor uh, Penrose a rest for a minute. I must stress that the consultation process is genuine and can categorically state that no decision has been made regarding the outcome of the consultation. Our own due process requires that we consider the proposals within the context of the feedback received as part of the consultation process. The consultation report, including the Community and Equality Impact Assessment, will be considered in September 2018, until which time no decision can be made. Indeed, this point has been clearly made in responses to the several questions already answered this evening. You will be aware that the consultation period has only just closed and at this point in time, a full analysis of responses has not been possible. Question number 15 is from Mrs. Haverfield to the leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Haverfield. As I've already advised, the consultation period has only just closed and at this point in time, a full analysis of the responses has not been possible. It will only be possible to meaningfully comment once a full analysis has been undertaken and I and my Cabinet colleagues have had an opportunity to reflect on the consultation responses. Cabinet will only receive a report on the consultation after the summer recess until such time it would not be appropriate to comment on specific issues relating to the consultation and the way forward. Question number 16 is from Mr. Evans to the leader. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Evans. The funding of the capital programmes requires the use of monies from a range of different <coughs> sources. For commercial reasons, it is not appropriate to make public internal valuations packed into the programme. 
when developing any scheme, a detailed business plan is required for submission to Welsh Government before they will release their element of the funding. This plan has not been developed as yet for the developments in the Western Vale. Further work on assessing the value and sale of the land would be progressed should the final determination of Cabinet be to implement the proposals. Again, I would reiterate that the way forward will only be assessed once a full analysis has been carried out of all responses to the consultation undertaken. Question number 17 is from Mrs Wilson to the Leader. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mrs Wilson for the question. In terms of the intention of both consultation documents, there is no specific difference between transfer and migration. Both documents propose the provision of a new building for the school, staff, pupils and governors to transfer into, with additional places available for pupils residing in the new housing developments in Roos. Migration was used in the first consultation to explain to the community the proposal that the school, as an entity, would be retained when relocated to a new site. Transfer is a term used in the School Organisational Code 2013, and following feedback, it was felt appropriate to reflect the exact terminology in the code in order to reduce confusion. The definition and differences between a transfer and closure of schools is contained within the code, with clear references within the consultation document. This proposal is being considered under Section 2.2 of the School Organisational Code 2013. This section refers to regulated alterations of a school, which includes the transfer of any existing school to a new site. And back to Councillor Penrose. Question number 18 is from Ms Hutchinson Tate to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Ms Hutchinson Tate, for your question. The statutory school organisation consultations are carried out by school organisation and access team. The work associated with the second consultation has been accommodated within the current resources. No additional staff costs were incurred. Non-employee related costs associated with the second consultation such as printing were approximately £105. This is kept low as the majority of the consultation material is now distributed electronically. Question 19 is from Ms Thomas to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you Mr Mayor, thank you Mr Thomas for your question. A variety of options were appraised and discounted during the development of the Council's Strategic Outline Programme for Band B of the 21st Century Schools Programme. This was extended and a complex piece of work and the outcomes were presented in the consultation report and reflect the internal considerations and conclusions that were made. Question number 21 is from Mr Barrett to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Makes reference to a number of times to the fact that Plancarvin is categorised as a good school and also references its successes. This document was developed as a response to feedback received within the first consultation and sought to better align itself to the language used in school organisation regulation as well as by professional organisations such as ESCO. Question number 22 is from Ms Joanne Cheek to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Sir. Mr Mayor and Mrs Cheek, the Council would like to reassure the public that officers are seeking to establish a balanced set of controls that permit dog owners to enjoy the amenity offered by our many open spaces, along with those who enjoy, whose enjoyment of the same spaces could be detrimentally affected by the actions of irresponsible dog owners. Allowing a dog to foul in public and then not picking it up is a criminal offence under the Dogs Fouling of Land Act 1996. Also, it is important that we enforce our dog ban on those beaches where dogs are currently prohibited, for, for example, Whitmore Bay and the Nap. This ban is in force from the 1st of May to the 30th of September. Our current bylaws are old and do not in, in every case allow enforcement via fixed penalty notices. Hence, offenders have to be pursued through the courts which can be both costly and ineffective. Essentially, we are seeking public views on amending, removing or mirroring, mirroring the 
the current bylaw controls using the Public Space Protection Order, PSPO, and the public are urged to read fully the draft notice of proposal and maps before providing comments via the public consultation process. The existing bylaws regarding dog controls in the Vale of Glamorgan will remain enforceable until conclusion of the PSPO process. The consultation is available on the Council's website where a survey can be, can be completed to provide comments. This consultation is open until the 22nd of August 2018. Question number 23 is from Ms. Fieven to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services. Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Bevan, <coughs> the conservation area is a fenced off area at the west end of the beach <coughs> alongside the coastal path. The pond areas are not included in the proposal. There is no proposal for the coastal path. However, the area around the ranger's cottage is included as this is a working yard with the use of machinery and vehicles. There have been issues where dogs have not been sufficiently controlled in this area. The pitch and putt course is used by families and the proposal is that dogs are controlled by leads. The proposals are currently out for public consultation and everyone with an interest is encouraged to make their views known through this process. A public space protection order gives the council a better opportunity to manage and control antisocial behaviour associated with dogs in some public areas, helping to ensure that those areas can be better enjoyed by everyone. We have now um, come to the end of our uh, allotted time, so therefore can I move, um, move that we can... Can someone move that we can continue yeah. for the remaining questions? Mr. Mayor, can I move that we uh, continue to answer the questions as we had rather a short um, business meeting tonight, but not too late. So I think on this occasion we should carry on. Council agree. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So question number 24 has been withdrawn. Question number 25 is from Mrs. Pritchard to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services. Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Pritchard. In my view, all irresponsible dog owners or members of the public should be penalised for not picking up after their dogs or dropping litter. In order to issue a fixed penalty notice for offence or to progress court action against an offender, the act of either fouling and not picking up or discarding litter and not picking up must be witnessed, preferably by an officer who has the powers to serve the penalty uh, for the offence. You cannot prosecute a football club for litter left by persons who may or may not be connected with that club. We believe that we have adequate litter bins around the Buttrell's field area. We, we undertake enforcement duties on our sports fields. Notwithstanding that, I would thank you for your question and would advise that I will be seeking to arrange further patrols in the Buttrell's field area on match days aimed at addressing this particular problem. Question number 26 is from Mrs Morgan to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, Mrs Morgan, uh, despite several educational interventions, there continue to be issues across the Vale of Glamorgan with some irresponsible dog owners, especially where dog feces are not being removed. We know that the majority of dog owners are responsible and we do not want to prohibit them from using open spaces in the Vale of Glamorgan. We are merely seeking to establish a balance where all users can enjoy our public open space areas without the risk of one group of users detrimentally affecting the enjoyment of another. In relation to St Athan playing fields, the Council is proposing to introduce a requirement for a person who is in charge of a dog at that time to remove its dog feces. Also, the council proposes a dog ban for marked sports pitches. This will mean that dogs can roam free when the sports pitches are not officially marked. When the pitches are marked, dogs can still be walked around the pitch per perimeter areas. 
there is no lead restrictions being proposed in this area. I would encourage you to visit our website to view the notice of proposal and the maps that relate to it. Question number 27 from Mrs Davis to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services. Mr Mayor, Mrs Davis, I would refer you to my previous response to question 26 uh, from Mrs Morgan, which deals with the St Athen area. I would add that fencing off sports pitches is expensive and impractical in this case seen as what is being proposed is a seasonal ban. That means that dogs can use the pitch location outside of the sporting seasons when the pitches are not officially marked. Question number 28 is from Miss Greenfield to the Cabinet Member for Neighbourhood Services. Mr Mayor, Mrs Greenfield, the Vale of Glamorgan has excellent amenity space for all users and there are a number of parks, open spaces and beaches for dog users to take advantage of. It is, however, regrettable that there are still a small number of dog owners who do not take responsibility for their dog when it comes to using these open spaces. As a consequence, the Council is proposing to introduce dog controls through a public space protection order to try to help address irresponsible dog ownership. The notice of proposal and maps can be viewed on the Council's website. Without looking at this information, it can appear that the dog Council is proposing to ban dogs from certain areas altogether, and this is not the case. In relation to Jackson's Bay, Jackson's Bay footpath and Red Brink, Brink Crescent, the Council is proposing to introduce a requirement for a person who is in charge of a dog at that time to remove its dog faeces. The Council has pl placed signs in this area which consist of the notice of proposal and a map. These signs do not show no access to these areas. The signs are for information purposes asking the public to complete an online survey and make comments on this proposal. As I said earlier, I would encourage anyone with an interest to visit our website and to take part in the consultation exercise. Question 29 is from Mr Wallace to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Wallace, for your question. The Government has stated the minimum age for legal gender recognition is 18, aligned with the full rights and responsibilities of adult citizenship, and the Government has no intention of changing this. However, nothing in the Government's reform of the Gender Recognition Act, Government consultations, state there is a high chance of gen transgender ideas not persisting in young people as they mature. In respect to the Transgender Inclusion Toolkit and Guidance, the Government has stated, reform to the Gender Recognition Act will not change the legal right of trans children. We have also said that the Equality Act 2010 provisions will not change. The Transgender Inclusion Toolkit and Guidance is consistent with this view and advises schools to address each gender identity question on a case-by-case -case basis and to explore how a range of needs can be met without compromising the rights of any child. The development of the Transgender Guidance for Schools is consistent with the view expressed by Penny Mordant, Minister for Women and Equalities, who stated a culture change is needed to reduce the discrimination and bigotry that transgender community faces. In conclusion, there is not to be, to be any reason why the government's reform of the Gender and Recognition Act for government consultation should prompt the council to delay dissemination, in sorry, dissemination of the Transgender Inclusion Toolkit and Guidance. Question number 30 is from Miss. Greasby to the Cabinet Member for Learning and Culture. Thank you, Mrs. Greasby, for your question. I agree that the welfare of all Vale children is paramount. The issues raised here are complex and therefore need to be viewed on a case by case basis. Some children attending Vale School might access NHS medical intervention to support their gender transition 
and this intervention might include medication provided by a qualified medical practitioner and a prescription. There is no reason why this treatment would create a safeguarding concern. Any identified or suspected use of illegal drugs for any purpose by the child attending the Vale School would be considered as a safeguarding concern and would be managed within the existing child protection procedure. Breast binding is not associated exclusively with transgender behaviour and has been acknowledged for some time as a potential safeguarding issue when identified in the context of the cultural practice of attempting to flatten a child's developing breast by ironing or binding with the specific intention of postponing sexual development. Breast binding in this context would be managed within the existing child protection procedures. Breast binding performed by a child on themselves in relation to behavioural association with transgender identity is not necessarily managed appropriately as a child protection issue. Similarly, breast binding by a transgender child is undertaken in relation to the child's gender identity and not as a form of deliberate self-harm. Consequently, breast binding in this contact is not necessarily managed appropriately as a self-harm issue. This question supports the need for transgender guidance so that teachers and other staff are aware of the issues associated with children questioning their gender identity and able to provide appropriate and consistent support to the child in accordance with the accepted government-endorsed recommendations. Question 31 has been withdrawn and question 32 has already been answered. Therefore, the questions for the public has come to an end. Agenda item number 11, any items which I, uh, under part 1, that I decide to be urgent, I have none and nothing under part 2, therefore the meeting is closed. Thank you.